The following presentation is a production of Ride the Wave Media. It's the Best Birth Podcast, where we interview experts that elevate you as you prepare your heart and mind to have the best birth. Each episode, we'll interview professionals so you are prepared for pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. Our experts will build your confidence and empower you to trust your intuition throughout your pregnancy. This audio is taken from videos on YouTube. Watch the entire episode on YouTube at Birth Made Mindful. Welcome to the Best Birth Podcast. We are so excited for our episode today. We have our guest, Kelly Dean, the founder of The Tummy Team, and she is going to teach us all about our core before labor and after. Kelly Dean is a physical therapist and founder of The Tummy Team. She has over 25 years of experience, but was motivated to do this work because of her own motherhood journey. She personally struggled with five miscarriages and three complicated full-term births. Her own motherhood journey left her feeling broken and weak. She discovered she had a six-finger diastasis and severe functional core weaknesses that no one in the medical field could address. So she created what she needed. Now she works with clients around the globe, teaches at a university and professional conferences, and is on a mission to help women know better so they can have a better experience throughout their pregnancy, birth, recovery, and beyond. Thank you so much for being here, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I love talking about this. I, I feel like when we know better, we can do better, right? And we would love to hear just the the basics of how you got into this very like specific field of helping helping our course. Well, yeah, like like my uh, bio kind of said, I've been a physical therapist um, for a long time. Uh, for twenty, it's so weird to say twenty five years. It's hard to think that you've done anything for twenty five years. But um, I was when I was I was a collegiate athlete. Um, so I was a swimmer in high school and through college. I swam um, on a athletic scholarship. I, it was like my job. Um, and so I was always really uh, in tune with my body. And I did a lot of, you know, fitness. And I thought I knew, thought I knew how it was going to be. Um, I thought I was just going to be able to, you know, have a baby and do all the stuff and bounce right back. And um, that's not exactly how it worked. Um, and so when I first was in, you know, my first part of physical therapy, I was more of a stroke and brain injury um, therapist. I worked a lot in neuromuscular rehab. Um, so not so much outpatients, not, not like what a lot of times people think about when they go see a pelvic floor PT. Um, but I, you know, my body kind of fell apart with all of the births, all the miscarriages, um, and all the things I was trying to do to kind of what I thought I needed to do to keep myself strong was all the wrong things. And I didn't know it. You know, I was thought I was doing the right things. I was doing lots of sit-ups and crunches. I was running. I was trying to do some things. I was also doing yoga and Pilates. And um, I thought I was doing all the right things. But um, my body kind of was like falling apart little by little with each consecutive birth. And um, the trauma of of my births and of the losses also, I know now, really contributed to not really being connected to my core, but I, um, I didn't realize it was a core issue. I thought it was just a try harder issue. You know, mm -hmm. I thought it was just do more. Um, and I, um, I kind of was surprised when my sister-in-law, who's also a PT, um, saw me at like a, a Thanksgiving vacation. And it's like, I think you have a diastasis. And then she checked me and I had that six finger separation in my abdominal wall. And it was just this, eye-opening moment um that I was like oh that, there's something wrong and I thought you know I could just rehab this um but there was nobody really doing rehab everybody was like I don't know how you can fix that all of my colleagues all of my friends that did PT um nobody really knew what to do and a lot of people are like I think you need to have surgery it's really bad um so I went down the surgery route to kind of see and that was mortifying because they made it about like belly fat and you need a tummy tuck and all of these things. And I was like, but I am literally falling apart. My back hurt. I was wetting my pants. My SI joint was always out. I had all kinds of digestive issues. I looked six months pregnant all the time. Um, and I had very, like in hindsight, I could see I had very little capacity for new learning, 
for emotional stuff, um, for any of those kinds of things, you know? And so I, I, um, I kind of started figuring it out. I, it, it's weird because at first I, I thought I'm just going to stay for the surgery. Right. And, um, in the meantime, I met with like, I had a bunch of girlfriends over for, it was like a birthday dinner. And they were like, we should go. Our kids are getting older. We should go on a cruise together. And I was like, I have to save for surgery. And they're like, why? And so I started telling them. And they all lay down on the floor in my living room. And I check all of them. And they all had like four, five, six finger wide diastasis. And mm. I had this thing. Like, I was like, wait a second. What is happening here? Right? Like, either this is normal, which I knew it wasn't normal. Um, or this is an epidemic, which turns out it's kind of an epidemic. Um, and so all of those friends started looking up stuff. They're like, we're not getting surgery. Let's figure this out. And, and they started sending me stuff, um, to look at, and they're like, you need to look at this. You need to look at that. And, um, I started looking at what people were doing and there were pieces of the puzzle out there, but not the full puzzle. And so I just kept working on it, working on it. And then I shared at my mom's group at my church and, um, I checked 38 women and 36 of them had a diastasis. And, um, and then, and then my friend, my other friend said, it's like, you have a little tummy team. You're teaching everybody how to fix their tummy. And that's how the tummy team came about. And it's evolved since then. But, you know, I think a lot of things that we're passionate about come from something that we've experienced ourselves, and we want to help people not go through what we went through. Yes. And I love how on your website, it says just because it's common doesn't mean it's normal. And it is everywhere and we hear about it. Let's dive into how we can fix it. So you talked about the puzzle pieces. Can you tell us maybe what some of those pieces were that you found that could have been helpful, but maybe did not include the full picture of healing? Yes, I can. I, I try to be really careful because I never want to talk um, disparagingly about anybody else doing this work because I feel like anybody that does this work is passionate about it. So. I'm not going to use names of different of different programs because I, I just feel like that's not that's not helpful. Um, but what I did find is the biggest thing I the, the first thing I learned was um, about the transverse abdominus muscle, which is the deepest corset core muscle of our body. We all know about our crunch muscle, like the rectus abdominus muscle and the oblique muscle. But I, I, for, I started learning that the transverse muscle is this muscle that wraps around and pulls you together. So that was really like, I don't even remember learning about that muscle in school. I'm sure we did, but it wasn't high on the radar. We were learning about arms and legs, you know, and not much about those deep stabilizing muscles. Um, so I learned about that. And, but then what I found was most of the things out there were a series of exercises, you know, do all these exercises on your back, do all these exercises in hands and knees, do all of these exercises um, sitting up and do millions of them a day. And I was desperate like most people. And so I started out doing the desperate thing and it was not sustainable. Um, and it also, so, so then I started feeling guilty because I wasn't doing enough because remember how I thought it was a try harder problem. Um, so that just fed right into that try harder. Um, so it was like too much. The other thing I learned about was splinting, using an abdominal rehab splint to kind of pull the right and left side together to help it heal. Um, and I thought like there was a lot of mixed information out there about that. But what I found was, oh, this helps me feel that muscle. But there were some programs that have you do it really tight and do it for a really long time. And as a physical therapist, I kind of realized like if I need to put an ACE wrap on a sprained ankle to walk on that ankle. But if I do it super tight and never take it off, it's not going to help the ankle long term. So like there's a role for it, but not forever. And then I think the biggest thing I learned, and this came back from like my stroke and brain injury kind of background, was that no matter how many exercises I do, if it didn't move into how I lived my life every day, then it wasn't going to impact things. Like it had to have a functional component of it. So if how I'm bending over to pick up the socks and the Legos off the floor all day long is like a crunch pushing out on my tummy all day long, then I'm going to be one step forward, two steps back. So I had to figure out how to, 
how to make it work in real life. Because I was a mom, I had little kids and I wasn't going to be at the gym all the time, um, but I still needed to be strong and feel better for motherhood. So I think the big things that I learned was I needed to actually ironically stop all the core work I was doing because it was using the wrong muscles. I needed to find a balance between how to activate the right muscles and then how to use them functionally. And then I needed to recognize what postures and what things were keeping my body from healing. Like the body has a natural capacity to heal. I believe we're supposed to have babies and not fall apart. So why was I not healing? And that was kind of the, those were the really big things that I started seeing were missing from the information that was out there. There was a lot of like little YouTube videos and programs on doing certain exercises, um, but there wasn't this big picture of like, how does this look in a real life situation? So when you talk a little bit about functional mobility, can you give us a few examples of postures or things that we commonly might do wrong? Yeah. And it's certainly wrong. It's like we, if we don't know, we don't know, right? But the biggest, I think the biggest thing I could tell every mom listening to this that you could do for your core is elongate. <laughs> you guys think, right? Because the internal, if you think about what your core muscles are, they wrap around your torso, they connect your pelvis and your rib cage together, they hold your organs in place, they make you taller, they stabilize your spine, they, they support your pelvic floor, and they support the uterus when you're pregnant, right? Though that's what those muscles do. If you think about what we do all day long, it's upright. We do very few things that are active laying down. Most of their active day is sitting, standing, walking, is upright. Our body was designed for that postural muscles to hold us upright. So they are postural, structural, digestive, and respiratory in nature. More and, and whatever we do the most wins. So no matter if you spend six hours at the gym every day, who does that? But some people, maybe you still have, you know, another what, 18 hours a day. So what you're doing the most wins. And if we can elongate, when you guys elongated, you felt your core just did something. It had to do something. Whether you can maintain it or not is another story, right? But we have to start somewhere. And if we can just think about the posture of how we're sitting, how we're standing, how we're pushing the, the stroller, how we're picking up the car seat, how we're unloading the dishwasher, how we're nursing our babies, how we're going to the bathroom, um, all of the things, how we're cleaning our house, how all the things we do throughout the day, your core has a role in those things. And I don't train you to overthink those things. I give you the foundational part and then I help you build it into all of those things, which makes it not only doable, but sustainable. And then it makes your life be your workout because motherhood is a workout. If it wasn't, we wouldn't be so exhausted at the end of the day. Right. So like it, let's make it work for us instead of against us. And are most of the things that we can do just like bringing conscious awareness or are there actual tools like, you know, like a belly band or like one of those shoulder posture things that I'm sure you've seen? And I'm not sure if those are like a negative or a positive. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how we can go about just like bringing awareness to that? Well, I what I tell everybody is 50 percent of the solution is awareness. And then the other 50 percent is tools and strategies. OK, so. First, the, the reason I say 50 percent, and that's a huge percentage, is just awareness. So this is this is a lifeline to that mom that is exhausted and can't think of one more thing. Awareness is 50 percent of the solution because our body has a capacity to heal if we're not going against it. So when I say awareness, posture is one of it. And watching how many things you are doing that are pushing out and pulling apart your abdominal wall. And, and those are usually things that if you think about your, your pelvis, your pelvis is like a bowl and your ribcage like an upside down bowl. I kind of tell people like two sides of one of those plastic Easter eggs. We want those to be aligned and elongated. So when we are in a collapsed position, like the, the typical nursing posture, that collapsed position, it's like doing a crunch all day. And when we do a crunch, we round and our belly pushes out. Everybody. 
that's listening to this has had to do a crunch or chosen to do a crunch in their life, and they could think back and think, did my tummy get flatter or did it push out? It pushed out, right? So avoiding things that are always pushing out all on your tummy. So that's not just crunches, but how sitting collapsed, holding our breath and bearing down, doing stuff which pushes out. Those kinds of things, things that are pushing out, pushing out, pushing out. If we can minimize and eliminate that, you're going to get halfway there. And, and that was so true for me because I, I was doing lots and lots of crunches every night and I had a six finger wide diastasis. And when I learned about what the transverse was and what it did and how it elongated me and I just eliminated, it sounded so counterintuitive. I eliminated the crunches. I went from a six finger down to a three finger just by stopping doing the things that were causing the damage. It's kind of like if you have a leak in your bath, in your, in your basement, you could spend all day with towels and buckets, but if nobody turns off the water, you're going nowhere. So half of it is just that awareness part of knowing what's keeping your body from healing and how the muscle works. So that's the first half, not to be underestimated. The second half is connecting to that muscle because if it's gotten stretched out with pregnancy, if you're disconnected from it because of trauma, or if you've had chronic habits of collapsing or pushing out, then you have to kind of rewire your brain belly connection. And we start that with um, actually some breathing. Remember how I said that the core is a respiratory muscle? When we do an, uh, when we elongate and we do a forced exhalation, our tummy comes in right? That tummy comes in on a forced blow, like a shush or a blowing. That kind of thing draws in. If anybody's done choir, you know you came up. You project more when you draw that tummy in and you use that di diaphragmatic breathing. Well, that tummy comes in on that exhale, but it also helps you to feel that muscle. So we, we start retraining how people are breathing. A lot of them are breathing all in their chest muscles or breathing in opposition where they're kind of sucking in their tummy and then collapsing. And we need to actually expand and draw it in. And that will actually pull the, the core together like a nice snug hug that holds you together. It feels really good. The, uh, and the splint actually gives you a feedback to where that muscle is. So we use the split as a feedback tool. We put it on for the first, you know, initial part of rehab and initial part, part of postpartum so people can connect. And it's kind of like training wheels. If they're not quite strong enough to sit up well all day, this kind of comes along and gives them the support they need to put them in the best alignment. Um, and then, and then it's like how, once we get that initial connection and we we feel the muscle, then it's how are we using it, how we're walking. What is my posture like when I'm, when I'm walking, when I'm pushing the grocery cart, when I'm lifting stuff, when I'm feeding the dog, when I'm picking up the dog poop? You know, how am I moving in ways that keep me connected to my core so it's not like this separate exercises over here and my life over here? It should be the exercises make my life better, my life makes my exercises stronger, and it should be right married together like that. I love how you talk about the maintenance portion because you can solve for the problem, but maintaining it or working it into your normal life as a retrain. I remember I had C-sections and there were people who said, don't go up the stairs or don't do this, you know, and I was very worried about the incision. Uh, and so I thought that that was the reason. But looking back, I think that I shifted in certain ways to compensate for my abs. And so I I thought, oh, uh, I can do this. But just because you can doesn't mean you should. And so I was I think I I was ignoring their advice because, oh, I can do this, you know, but what are you causing by doing that? Right. And I think it's I think our culture here in America, especially, is very much like hit the ground running you know, um, and, and I actually am an instructor at a midwifery college um, as well. And I teach functional core and pelvic floor to new midwives. And one of the things we really, one of our, our um, week's lessons is on what we call the fourth trimester, which is that period of time 
and a trimester is three months after delivery to allow your body to gently and appropriately recover. So much of the pelvic floor stuff and the diastasis stuff that I see is people not allowing their body to heal from this major thing that happened. And the reality is you are, it takes longer to heal because you were sleep deprived. You just ran a marathon and nobody fed you while you were doing it. And now you are keeping this newborn alive by the juice of your boobs and you are exhausted, you know? So your nutrition really funnels into your breast milk and not into how you heal your body. And so we have to take time um, and it's appropriate to take time and it doesn't mean you're weak. It, do- it means you're doing it intentionally, not because you have to, because you, you should, you deserve to take a hot second to let your body heal. And, and I don't, that doesn't mean do nothing. I just want to say that. That doesn't mean just lay on in the bed because your body is a use it or lose it system. It's, it's how are we in those parenting postures? Like, how are we supporting ourselves well in those parenting postures? What kind of stretches are we doing? What kind of belly breaths are we doing? Kind of abdominal massage are we doing? What kind of connection exercises are we doing so we stay connected? And, and when we're disconnected from a muscle that got really stretched out or a group of muscles that got really stretched out, and then we start powering through pain, we don't notice things until they are significant. Hmm. And it's so much harder to fix something that's severe than it is to listen to that little whisper and course correct. You know. So when it comes to our fourth trimester plan, Is it intuitive or should we always be seeking out the experts to kind of guide us in that training schedule? I think it's a little bit of both, okay? Because everybody has a little bit of a different, um, you know, body awareness and and expectations of their life. You know, somebody that's going home that has three little ones at home and their dad and their the partner had to go back to work right away um, has a little bit different expectations on them, you know, than than somebody that this are new their new um, baby and first baby and, you know, maybe they have their mom that there to help them or their husband's up a tree leave for four months or something like that. You know, it's different scenarios. But what I would say is take the advice of experts who have been there, who know what you don't know. I would not go by how you feel because how you feel um, is really relative to your emotions and your her- hormonal swings, Right. And it's, so what I say that is like you could be very low, um, struggling with some baby blues or some postpartum depression and not want to get up and do anything and getting up and doing something actually would be helpful. Or you could be really feeling great and decide you want to clean the whole house because you are losing it, how dirty the house is. And now, you know, you're off. We, we kind of need to find a, a middle ground. Um, and one of the, one of the, concepts that um, we use in the midwifery school is 777, seven days in the bed. And that doesn't mean you can't get up, but it means you're pretty much staying in the bed. People are bringing stuff to you. Um, you're, you're figuring out the nursing. Um, you could prop yourself well, but seven days kind of near the bed, which means you're not really leaving the house. You can go back and take a pit stop at the bed anytime. And then seven, seven days you know, touching back to the bed. So that's like, you still, you can leave the house, but when you come back, you lay down. You don't go out and then come back and unload the dishwasher and check your email and do all those things when you're up and about. So it's really giving that, that's just 21 days, right? That's not even the full time. And that feels stir crazy to some people. But if we set up um, a support system ahead of time, we talk about that fourth trimester in the second and third trimester. So that they have, they have stuff for fruit smoothies. They have soups in the fridge. They have things planned. They have a strategy for people bringing them stuff. They know what kind of support they need that first week. Um, and then that second week, being able to do a little bit more. And that third week, you know, have childcare set up or somebody that can help them. So I think being proactive instead of reactive can go a long way. Hmm. This is incredible. And so often we feel like we'll get that badge of honor if we are up and at them. You know, like, look at me. I had my baby this week and I'm already, 
out at church and I'm already doing the grocery shopping. And we need to reverse that mentality where we say it takes time for me to heal. Even if I have to be supporting the family or supporting your job, you're still like aware of where you should be on that timeline. Yeah, I I think for sure. And I think what we don't know, um, what I see all the time, because they come and tell me the truth, is those people are the ones that are also experiencing prolapse or back pain or a lot of um, a lot of postpartum anxiety because they're very disconnected from their body. So there's there's more going on. Um, It's really important that we don't compare ourselves to each other. Um, There's more going on. And I think if we could change just the culture of taking care and honoring that sacred time after you brought a human being into the world, um, it will go a long way. And a lot of people are like, I got to get back. I got to get back. I was like, what if you go back to what you thought you needed to do and you have a setback for six more months? How crazy is that going to drive you? Like, let's just, you know, take our time. And what's cool about our approach here at the Tummy Team is I give them tangible things that they can be doing every time they nurse the baby, every time they change the baby. I build things into baby care routine um, to be mama care as well so that they are they feel what people are usually grasping for is I need to feel strong and connected again. And how I did that before was exercising, going for a long walk, doing these things. And so now I'm like, what if I can give you some of those feelings? Um before you jump back into that so that it's kind of like you're you're feeling supported and you have the tools you need um going going there and and I think talking about it ahead of time I think we're not doing anybody fa- any favors like pretending that it's not going to be hard you know I mean let's I don't want to scare people but I want to prepare them I want to prepare them for any scenario so that they feel empowered to handle whatever scenario that is. Mm. I love that. Well, we've talked a lot about this abdominal area. What about rib cage spreading? Are you working with that with the tummy team as well? For sure. So I um so if you think about if you kind of visualize the core, I'll I'll give you this picture for the people that are watching this. Um so that's the transverse abdominus, that picture. It's a corset that wraps around your lower six ribs all the way to your sternum from your back and all the way around your pelvis down to your pubic bone. And if you could kind of visualize like those old fashioned corsets that they tied up, we actually have that in our body underneath all the other muscles, that muscle. So where the rib, so you got to think about it pulls the ribs down and helps hold them together. And it holds the pelvis together so that SI joint that gets wobbly or that pubic symphysis joint that gets a little, eh, you know, those things, it helps glue those, those things together because our body naturally has a relaxing hormone that makes everything spread to make room and allow the pelvis to open up for the baby to get out of a very small hole, right? So we want to, we want to honor that our body's going to stretch but the muscles have to give us the structure to hold us together we need we need this marriage between stability and flexibility right like we need we need to be stable and be able to open so in the rib cage um a lot of it comes down to posture as well because we're seeing that people are having their babies later in life and they maybe worked on a computer or you know had access to a phone and have been looking down so their pec muscles are tight and their neck muscles are tight because they're a little bit more rounded forward in our technology um, loving state, right? And so those muscles also attach to your rib cage. So now your 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 stomach is pulling out and your ribs are tight. So if you go to come up, your ribs flare. So a lot of what's going on is strengthening the transverse throughout the pregnancy and releasing and opening up these chest muscles and strengthening those postural muscles that have gotten weak from the type of life we live because those muscles are going to be on overtime when we start holding a baby all day long and nursing a baby, right? We will be in those kidney bead postures. So we want to prepare and and strengthen those muscles to be able to hold the baby while we're nursing them like, you know, eight hours a day, right? So we want to recognize that there's a portion of that that impacts the ribs 
impacts the pelvis. Sometimes it's sciatica is part of what's going on, pubic symphysis, hip pain, even plantar fasciitis because of how our pelvis spreads and the weight we put on our feet differently. So it's there's this whole full body thing that starts with the core. Hmm. And during pregnancy, what do you recommend so that we can have that proper core strength even from the get-go? Well, the first thing I do is I educate everybody in what we call active sitting. So having them, and I'll, I'll t- take anybody that's listening, you're going to start out sitting at the edge of your seat. Sit, start at the edge of your seat so your feet are on the ground and you'll feel your sit bones, like the part that's on the bicycle bike, right? So the sit bones and elongating, that is putting your pelvis and rib cage in the right alignment, neutral alignment. So if you could do that at the edge of your seat, then I try to educate them to find a chair that you could sit all the way back, add lumbar support so that you can maintain that upright position. If you're sitting at a computer all day in the car, driving around, Whatever your life looks like, how can we get the pelvis and the rib cage to line up throughout the day so that the transverse has options to work? When the pelvis and rib cage aren't lined up where people are sitting on their tailbone all day, it turns off the transverse and it it impacts the um, fetal alignment. It puts the baby in a less than optimal alignment with the birth canal. It also tightens up muscles in the glutes and in the pelvis that actually keep the baby from being able to turn and drop down into the pelvic bowl. So if we can get you in those positions initially, I also teach a lot of stretches, what we call neutral pelvis stretches, hamstring release, um, a QL, like the side torso release, a butt release, calf release. And we build that into your everyday routine so that you're feeling like those muscles around your pelvis have the um, flexibility to get you in the right alignment. Um, We teach them the transverse activation, that exhaling. And on that exhale, we visualize zipping up our tummy and we do some different activations that way. And then what's really crucial for preparing for birth is the coordination and the disassociation between the core and the pelvic floor. Because the core is like a cylinder And the diaphragm is the roof of the cylinder and the pelvic floor is the floor of the cylinder. So we call it the floor of the core. And they, the core and the pelvic floor have a co-contraction. They work together um, 99% of the time, except for when we have a bowel movement and when we give birth. Then the transverse comes in and the pelvic floor needs to let go. And that coordination, if you have not practiced, is going to feel very weird and difficult in the middle of birth, in the middle of transition, in the middle of pushing phase. I always tell people, you know, let's not give somebody a math equation when they're in pain. That's not going to be the best time to learn new information. So we work on that coordination of the core and pelvic floor um, every time they go to the bathroom. And how many times a day do you pee when you're pregnant? Too many, right? Every time you have a bowel move, drawing your tummy in, relaxing your pelvic floor, we teach people to use a squatty potty which puts your feet up, opens up the pelvic canal, and it simulates the birth position. Everybody gives birth in a squatted position, whether you're on your back, on your side, you have to be in a squatted position to get the baby out. That's the only way. Nobody's crossing their legs to get a baby out. Things are open and up. So we start practicing the alignment, the connection, the coordination. So it's not foreign to your body. You feel very empowered. Even if you end up having an epidural, you feel very empowered that you're connected to your body because an epidural makes you numb, doesn't make you paralyzed. You actually still have voluntary control of those muscles. You just have no feedback loop. So you have to have created a feedback loop prior so you know you can do it without having to feel it. Wow. That is fascinating. I feel like this is such valuable knowledge for a first-time mom or someone who is planning to have more children, just learning how to train your body to do this. Yeah, it, it's Ooh. like I said at the very beginning, I feel like when we know more, like when we know the right things, we can have a better experience. And sadly, I didn't learn any of this until I had had all my kids. I had had all my kids and then I was like, oh my gosh, everything would have been so much better. But I've had the pleasure 
and the privilege of coaching thousands of women through like really redemptive births. And, mm. and even if it ends up in a C-section, they feel like they were connected to their body or they feel like after the delivery, they, they could connect to their body again, even if they, they end up getting in a, an epidural when they wanted to not have an epidural, they feel like they had a path and they knew what they needed to do. Um, and it's just been, you know, I've been able to be at several births. I've been able to coach. And now it's kind of interesting. Like I'm now helping, um, my kids' friends, my, my kids haven't had babies yet, but my kids' friends are having babies and my friends' kids are having babies. So I've like, I feel like I'm like, um, being really a, a part of changing the next generation of how they birth. I love that. I love the phrase that it's never too late because like you said, it, it was after you had your kids, but you were able to shape so many other people's lives because of the knowledge that you learned. And even that awareness piece, the 50% that we talked about, knowing that I have recently been aware that I've been holding my stomach muscles really tight and not allowing that elongation. And so being more aware has has helped me even now, even though I have given birth in the past and don't know if I will in the future. It's just every little change helps. Well, and and the other thing that I do, it, it is never too late because the, the other part of my work is I actually um, train PTs and OTs that work with seniors that live in skilled nursing facilities and long-term care facilities. I am working on core and pelvic floor at the end of their life when they're struggling with incontinence, when they're struggling with with back pain and and in constipation. And I work with people when they have their babies, with the little babies. Like, I mean, we need core and functional core and pelvic floor for everything. Hmm. Never too late. Because when when you I want you to be strong, like you may people may be hearing this after they're done having their kids and they're like, oh, I wish I would have known. Oh well. But what are you doing now? You're still a parent. You're still involved in your community. You're still involved in your life. And I want you to feel strong. I don't want you to leak when you cough and sneeze or laugh. I don't want you to be like overwhelmed with, um, you know, all of like feeling like you don't have the capacity. You don't feel like strong. You don't have the posture. It's amazing how posture can transform how you view the world and how the v world views you. Mm. Uh, I think it's really it's never too late. Never too late. We've heard so much about that superwoman stance or that superman stance. I think recently a lot of people are taking to just how do you feel after you stand in this stance for two minutes? Right. Well, yeah. And I I um, have different ways that depending on my audience that I share that, you know, kind of like I sometimes speak at church groups and I'm like, you need to stand like you're the daughter of a king because you are right. The daughter of a king right? Royalty stands a certain way. When I'm talking to athletes, you know, I, I also coach a swim team. It sounds like I do a lot of different things, but I have a lot of passions. So I go a lot of different directions. I, but I, I don't want them like up on the blocks like this. I'm like, you stand like an Olympian on that block, you know, nice and tall and connected to your body and strong and empowered and ready to go. You know, like how we hold ourselves um, matters. And it actually asks the muscles to do what we need them to do. Because if everybody could just sit up taller, they would have the strength to do it. As soon as I tell everybody posture, if I even use the word posture, when I'm speaking, everybody adjusts how they're sitting, but nobody can maintain it, right? Because it takes strength. Strength comes from asking a muscle to do it something over and over and over again. So it comes down to consistency and opportunity. So I'm going to help you find the opportunities and help you be consistent. Consistent doesn't mean you have to be perfect and 100%. It means what's going to work the best for your life with what you have every day. And mm -hmm. so I think that that was the biggest thing when I started on my journey to see who was doing this type of work. It felt like a lot of pressure to be perfect, a lot of pressure to do so much. And I had so much to do and I just it felt shaming a little bit to like if I wasn't going to do all the things and I really don't want my work to feel that way to anybody I want them to I want to create opportunities and awareness so that they can see how even just a little step can change the direction of the whole ship you know 
um, and small things do matter and just start small and be successful there. In the book, Hands Free Mama, she says, when you finally let go of perfection, you discover it wasn't necessary to carry all that weight to become the person you were meant to be. 100%. 100%. Kelly, this has been an incredible conversation. We feel completely uplifted, elongated. We feel like we want to be that birth goddess and that birth Olympian that we can be. I am so excited to share your resources with all of our listeners. Are there any other resources that you would recommend? Maybe a book, another expert? Well, there's a lot of cool people doing a lot of cool things out there. Um, I, I want people to realize that I have, um, so I am a physical therapist and I have, uh, I had a, 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 cl- a clinic for a long time and I recently transitioned to be, have a completely online clinic, which allows me to treat so many more people and gives me the flexibility to do all the other teaching that I do and the coaching and all the other things that I do. But um, what's really cool is that I have free resources on my website, thetummyteam.com. I have a, a paid membership that's like $15 a month where you can get a, just a weekly series of like how to, how to figure out the breathing in a week. You know, like a bunch of just bite-sized pieces for people that are in the throes of it. And then I have, you know, a, a, another level where you could go through the rehab course week by week with videos, me showing you how to do this stuff so that you can go all the way to prepare for your pregnancy. You can go preparing for postpartum. I have a trauma recovery course on there. I have courses for men, for your husbands. I have, you know, a, 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 tra- a course for toddlers. So there's a lot of resources out there at, at a small investment of time and finances that you can get those resources. Um, I, I'm a fan of a lot of people doing this work, um, you know, and doing different parts of the work. I think Katie Bauman is really cool because she talks a lot about alignment and thinking about how we sit and stand, how we move. I've learned a lot from her. Um, yeah, I can't think of it. Uh, the other people, a lot of the people that I follow are not people that they're they're not people that a, a, an average mama would probably follow because I'm like I'm like I, I nerd out on the on the science of it. <laughs> Nerds are welcome here. Yes. I love that you have made this care accessible to so many people by having it online. Thank you for doing that. Every week we end by sharing a mom squad secret of the week. And so this one is from Sharon. She says, if you can save some of your maternity leave or vacation days for the four month sleep regression. So a good thing to note too, after that third, that fourth trimester comes that That's four month so sleep smart. regression. That's so smart. I love that. I wish I had that advice. Kelly, is there anything else that you'd like to share today? I No, I feel really honored to be a part of this. Thank you so much for helping get the word out for all the things that you are doing. I know I just do one piece of the puzzle. Um, I just want people to know that there's options out there. And this is an amazing time to be alive in the sense that if you don't have a specialist where you live, you have access to a specialist no matter where you live, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I love that don't, don't settle for less. Don't power through. Um, if something feels intuitively wrong to you, keep looking. You just haven't found the right answer yet. And maybe it's me, but it might not be me. Maybe it's somebody else. But just don't give up because there's so many amazing resources out there. And just don't be scared to ask your friends. Um, you At the beginning of my story, you know, like it was my sister that checked my diastasis. It was my girlfriends that that like made me realize I needed to do this work. It was my church group, the mom's group that were like, oh my gosh, help me fix my tummy. You know, ask people, don't be shy talking about the things because you'll be surprised at how many other people are struggling and maybe they found an answer or maybe together you can find an answer. And I think I just want people to have hope and encouragement. Mm, We love that. Thank you so much for sharing today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us on today's episode. We hope you've been elevated and inspired by this week's expert. Subscribe today so you never miss an episode. And please share our podcast or post on your social media so that other moms and dads-to-be can also have the best birth. Please note that the information provided is based on the expert's insights and personal experience. It is not intended as medical guidance. Please seek the advice of your medical provider as it applies to your specific condition.